My wife provides tutoring services and has typically been paid as an independent contractor by an overall director. That director had multiple people she was paying. However, like many former independent contractors, she's going to start being paid as a licensee instead of an independent contractor. In this video, I'm going to seek to answer some of the financial and tax questions that this transition raises. So independent contractor versus licensee, what's the structural difference from a financial standpoint? In the independent contractor structure, you have a bunch of students or clients who pay an overall director or a company, and then that company then directs some payment to an individual that they call an independent contractor, and they pay them to provide services to the underlying clients. Now, in our case, it's a tutor who's providing services or tutoring services to students and the money flows from the clients to the director and then back to the tutor who provides the services. And that's often been categorized as an independent contractor payment. Now, what we're seeing is a big shift from this independent contractor structure more to a licensee structure. In this case, the underlying students or clients are paying the tutor to provide tutoring services. And in turn, that tutor is remitting some portion, usually a percentage of that, back to a director who is overseeing a big group. So the flow of funds is different. It goes through the individual or the tutor, my wife in this case, and then she pays a licensing fee to the director. That's very different. So why are we seeing this big shift from independent contractors to licensees? Well, there's been a lot of changes from an employment law standpoint that is making independent contractors now fall under the category of an employee. Well, the problem is this causes a massive amount of bureaucratic headaches for the individual or the company who's directing or essentially kind of finding and placing these individuals. Now, that increases the cost to the individual company or director, which may make them then decide to not do it, in which case everyone is worse off. So that's why we're seeing the shift. And it's under that general idea that most of my discussion is going to fall. Generally then, the only material change is the flow of funds, not the services that are provided by the individual to the clients or the net amounts that are earned by the individual or the tutor in our case. This isn't to say there can't be a lot of other changes that are pushed out down to the licensees as part of the licensee contract, but that's generally outside the purview because it doesn't really fall into why we're seeing this big shift from my perspective. So what does this mean for you as a former independent contractor moving more towards a licensee structure? Well, it really actually means very little from a financial perspective. There are some financial consequences. Your revenues will go up. The amount of cash you receive will be a little bit higher under the licensee structure than it was under the independent contractor structure. And that is because you're receiving the total amount from your clients or from your students, whereas before you received a net amount, the amount net of what the director kept. However, the increase in revenues should be almost essentially fully offset by the increase in expenses because now you have to pay your director a licensing fee. That licensing fee is treated as an expense to you. It reduces the amount of taxes you're going to have to pay and the amount of net income you're going to report on your taxes and how much you're walking away with. So on a net basis, it really shouldn't make any difference at all. It does just change. It increases your revenues and it increases your expenses. What in the accounting field we just call it, it just grosses everything up from your perspective. Now, there are some administrative consequences. You will receive a bunch of checks as revenue instead of just one check from the director as you have in the prior years. And you will also have to write a check for the licensing fee paid to the director, which you didn't have to write that check before. Also, from a tax perspective, you will not receive a Form 1099 from your director showing how much you received from them because your director is not paying you. And I highly doubt that your clients or the students are going to prov be providing you a Form 1099 associated with the revenues that they are giving you because they're not businesses and aren't required to for file a Form 1099 like your director is who is treated as a business. So. In general, there aren't a lot of big financial changes, but I did want to take this opportunity to do a quick overview of the tax implications 
of providing these services in general. Now, this is a topic I have covered in other videos. I have one on tax con tax overview for YouTube creators. A lot of the concepts are gonna be very similar to that one, and I actually go into a lot more detail in that video. If you have questions, I encourage you to watch that video as well. I'll put a link to it in the description below. So, a quick tax overview. You are considered a business by the IRS. You but you don't have to register as a business or a corporation, LLC, whatever, with your state, which if you wanted to set up a big formal legal structure, you could do that. There's nothing saying you can't. I will say it does cost money to file. And uh, at least in a lot of states, you do have to pay a franchise tax every year then for that business. So in general, unless this is becoming a big revenue source for you, you're probably not going to end up registering as a business with the state. However, from an IRS standpoint, you are running a business. It's just a sole proprietorship. It's not an LLC or a corporation. So from an IRS standpoint, you are self-employed, which means you will be filing a Schedule C and a Schedule SE, which is, stands for self-employment, with your tax return at the end of the year. On the Schedule C, you'll list all of your cash receipts and all of your expenses and your net income, which you'll pay taxes on. And you will pay both income taxes and self-employment taxes. Income taxes will be based on your tax rate that you're paying on your other income. Your self-employment taxes are generally going to be about 15% of your net income. And that represents essentially Social Security and Medicare payments that you have to pay as an employee as well, but you pay half and technically your employer pays half is how it comes out of the statements when you're employed. If you're self-employed, you're playing both the employee piece and the employer piece. That equates to about 15% of your income. Now, as you're running this new business that you've just created, you're going to have to pay taxes on net income. And you should want to track your net income just from a perspective of knowing how you're doing for the year and whether it makes any sense for you to do this. So you have net income. Net income is the amount you receive minus the expenses or the costs you incur to do this. Now, the amount you receive, this is called your gross income, your cash receipts or sales if you're looking at the Schedule C itself. Any payments you receive are taxable. It doesn't matter where they come from, just because you don't receive a 1099 does not suddenly mean you now don't have to pay taxes. You do still have to claim that as income or gross income. However, you are now a business, so you also get to take expenses out of that gross number to arrive at a net amount that you would actually pay taxes on. The expenses reduce the amount of income you'll have to pay taxes on. Expenses are going to include, as we've talked about, the licensing fee will be an expense. So that will reduce the amount you have to pay taxes on. Other things like any supplies you purchase, any books you purchase, any travel or mileage just driving to provide your services, those are all deductible expenses. Anything that is considered ordinary and necessary to, for you to provide those services is considered an expense. Make sure you track it. What I end up seeing a lot is people receive this income and they don't know all the expenses that they can put against that income to reduce their taxes and they end up paying too much in taxes. Keep records of everything and remember, anything that is ordinary and necessary for you to provide that service is an expense and reduces the amount of taxes you have to pay on it. In conjunction with that, keep records of everything. That's generally going to be a list of all your income and expenses keep receipts, keep copies of the checks you receive. Those would, those would form essentially an audit base if for some reason the IRS decided to audit you, which is incredibly unlikely for this amount of money, but it is always possible. So keep records. A best practice that I, that I recommend to people, anyone starting their own business and are receiving income and are gonna have expenses, is going to be to open a separate checking account. It's usually pretty easy, especially online now. This allows you to keep a nice clean list of all of your inflows and outflows of cash. And then at the end of the day, it's just a matter of you trying to find and make sure you keep all the receipts associated with all the outflows. And then you know exactly how everything's netting out at the end of the period. I also do have a whole video that walks through kind of setting up an Excel spreadsheet to track this. I'll put that link also down in the description below. The important thing is that keep this all separate from your personal stuff. That is a very quick overview of some of these considerations and things you should 
keep in mind as you're moving into this starting and running your own business. Again, I encourage you to look at my other videos as well as there's a lot of other videos on YouTube that talk about the tax implications of starting your own small business. I encourage you to look at those if you have additional questions. So I did hope you enjoyed this little summary of the financial implications for licensee versus independent contractors. If so, please give it a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to see future content and check out other accounting and finance related content from Accounting Outside. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and God bless.